this verse. Paul is uh, inventing words to describe theology. He, he's inventing words to describe theology. Because no words had been invented that, as far as he was concerned, that could tell the story like he wanted to tell it. So he's beginning to put words together to, to describe the deity of Christ and the person of God. Hytina. Hytina. Eston. Logol. Logol. Man. Ekonta. Sophias, Sophia, N, N. And by the way, the word N, what was the old form of that in classical and uh, what we call the uh, dialectic Greek? You know what that was? It's shortened. It was any. Any. All right? Any. And it was dropped to N, and that's, of course, where we got our word in from this preposition. Etho, wo, fro, of Thracion, that is. Ethel lo Thracion. Ethel lo Thracion. Alright. Ty. Ta pe no frosine. Ta pe no frosine. And then Ty is in a sense there, but it isn't there. I've got it written there in parenthesis. I want you to understand that. And a fabia. So Matos, Uk, Teme, oh Uk, N, Teme, Tine, Pros, Play So Mene, Play So Mene, Pace, Pace, Sarcos, Sarcos, There's a lot of words in here. <coughs> Witches is how it begins. Are things, which is, is account indeed having a wisdom. All right. Paul is again uh, attacking the Gnostics. What did the Gnostics teach? What are some of the things <coughs> that the Gnostics taught? They thought that they were the real knowledgeable people. All right. These were the people that had the answers to all the world's mysteries. And they call them mysterio, or the my mysterio. And Paul uses their terms, except he turns the terms on them. All right. And that's what he's doing here, which is an account. The word account ledger, indeed. This word men, indeed, a particle of affirmation. And then the word ekonta, having. Accusing plural neuter, neuter, present participle active, comes from echo. And then we have the word Sophias. But the word Sophias here, what does the word Sophia usually mean? Wisdom. Okay, wisdom. That's a very high word for wisdom, as Paul and, and the writers of the New Testament use it. It's, uh, it's uh, ultimate wisdom. So, sophistry, all right, philosophy, all right, the love of wisdom. So he's using this term here, the sophic sense. It's a bad sense, all right? And uh, now he uses a plural which is there, and then he goes back to a singular verb. Third person singular, present indicative active, esten, all right? Each one of these accounts, each one of these mysteries that they have, indeed, having wisdom in Ethelophraskia. Now this word here is something else. It means self self willed sacrificial worship. Will worship. People will do what they want to do. They are narcissistic in a way, that term. That's a it's an old term that means that you're right and everybody else is wrong. It's the person that's, uh, that holds a high opinion of their own opinions. All right? This uh, sacrificial worship here, we get the word sacrifice in it, and we have the word fellow. Fellow and thraskia. All right? Fellow means I wish, and it's a self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. 
we have, uh, in the Catholic Church, we have a lot of self-sacrifice. Down on the Philippine Islands, what do they do? Every year around Easter time. Oh, they they begin to beat themselves. themselves. And they have themselves, and some of them have themselves crucified and nailed to the cross, crosses. And they're put up there for a certain amount of time. Now, people, that is not good. That is blasphemy. People that, uh, we have uh, monks. I talked to you here a while back about St. Patrick. Remember about St. Patrick when I talked about him? What kind of a person was St. Patrick as far as theology goes? Really, in reality. Now, the Catholic Church called him a saint. He was a Baptist by practice and by theology. That's what he was. He, even the Catholics will admit in their encyclopedias and everything that St. Patrick was not the kind of Catholics that they were, but he was a very primitive Christian. All primitive Christians were what? <laughs> all right. Simple as that. All you go back in the first two or three hundred years and they're all Baptists by doctrine and practice. Okay? And that's what he was. But they said that he began the monasteries. What is a monastery? That's where people go and they fast and they go without uh, a normal uh, life. A normal love life. Man, God created man. And then he took from man, he took woman. And he put man and woman back together and they made one being. All right? And he said that the man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And that's normal. That's normal. When you become uh, monks, that's not normal. That's not normal. Some people, the, the, the Word of God, and even Jesus himself, some people uh, that are born into this world, uh, back in the days uh, that when Jesus walked on the earth, uh, there were eunuchs. You know what a eunuch is? Mm -hmm. The kings had uh, uh, men uh, castrated. They were neutered. And, that, and they put them over their harems so that they wouldn't be worried about them trying to seduce uh, his wives or his girlfriends or mistresses or whatever was in this harem. Well, Paul said there's some, or, and the Lord said there's some men that are made eunuchs by other people. Sometimes people get their mind on God so much in this world that they don't want to do anything but live for God. They're not interested in a regular uh, activity between male and female. Now, that's sometimes happened. What happened in Paul's case? He was a eunuch, wasn't he? He wasn't a eunuch to begin with, was he? To be on the Sanhedrin court, what did you have to do? Well, the qualifications had been on the Sanhedrin court, which he was. And a Pharisee. You read a rabbi. Well, a rabbi, that was your doctor of theology. That's what rabbi means, PhD. You had to have family. You had to raise your family up. You had your wife and your family had to be uh, citizens. That <coughs> be useful in their life. They, they, you had to have your children uh, under subjection. They had to be uh, citizens. They had to be good children before you could ever get on the Sanhedrin court and before you could even be a Pharisee. But Paul, when he became a Christian, his wife divorced him and his children disowned him. Paul had himself made a eunuch, according to history. And he was a eunuch. Paul had a very special calling. He was an apostle of God. Now, different churches and different times, we've got these uh, uh, monasteries and monks where people are going there and they're beating themselves and, and starving themselves and fasting and, and uh, uh, living a, a different life. That's this term right here. Self-willed sacrifice. They want to be holy, but they're not holy from the right reason. Paul the Apostle, he said, uh, it's all right for you to marry. It's fine. He said, I can get married too. Peter, you know, he said, I can get married. Paul could have got married again. He said he could have. He could have got married again. 
but he said he would take up too much of my time, and I have a specific purpose to do in this world. Paul was trying to do the will of God. Many people become monks because they want to be holy. They're trying to get to God. Paul was ex expounding. He wanted to spend the rest of his life for God's service. All right? That's the, the right kind, and then we have the wrong kind of this self-willed sacrifice. All right? And then we have the word can, tying this, or, or chi, tying this to and, a conjunction. And then we have the word papenophrosine. All right? There's another word. By the way, this word etholotherescia, that's Paul's uh, invention there. All right? That comes from sacrifice and will. Paul invented that term. As far as we know, it's found nowhere else in Greek writings anywhere. You can go to the Liddell and Scott, and how many of you have seen Liddell and Scott? That's profane and sacred Greek literature, and you will not find this word anywhere except where Paul used it. All right? And then it says humility, this word tapeno prosine. And this is a bad verse, the bad sense of humility. Again, Paul is, uh, what kind of people were doing this kind of monastery type life? We have a term uh, today when a man and a woman have a friendship that doesn't have anything to do with affection. What is that called? Platonic. A platonic feeling. A friendship. Platonic. What's platonic mean? Where did it come from? Plato. All right, Plato. You have all kinds of problems. The Gnostics said that that uh, 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 their spiritual senses, that as long as they didn't mix the spirit with the flesh, they were all right. If you thought good thoughts, everything's okay. You could do whatever you wanted to with your body because it really didn't affect your mind at all. So you could go out and just be a whoremonger or a liar or a thief or whatever you wanted to kill her. And if you thought good thoughts, everything was okay. Now Plato, he went to the extreme the other way. You just totally separate yourself from all natural desires. And that's the real mystery. That's the real happiness. That's real euphony. All right? Euphoria for that, I should have said. Then we have, like I said, it's an added word, chi. It's there, but it isn't there. It's understood. And then we have the word authadia. What in the world does this mean? Off and fading. Off and fading. It means not to spare. How many of you ever heard of uh, uh, General George Armstrong Custer? You ever heard of him? George Armstrong Custer? He was a general, all right? Well, actually, he was a lieutenant. <laughs> there at last, he was busted. He, he uh, did some pretty stupid things in his life. He rode several horses to death. And when he would take his troops, sometimes he said, Don't spare the horses. Run them to death. Run them to death. We're gonna, we are out here to do something. Run the horses to death. Push them beyond. Custer would get something on his mind, and nothing else existed. If he saw a buffalo out there someplace and he, and he decided he wanted to go chase that buffalo, he'd go chase that buffalo for three days if he had to, to kill that buffalo. Or if he thought there was a buffalo out there. He got lost. He rode horses to death many times. One time he, he was uh, out with his troops, out on a detail, and all of a sudden he wanted to be with his wife. So he rode a hundred and something miles and rode his horse to death to be with his wife. Just abandoned his truth. He was court martial for that. But he did not spare the horses. The Apaches were an unusual Indian people. They were different than a lot of them. Apaches didn't grow anything. Did you know that? They didn't have they they were not uh, farmers at all. You know what Apaches did? Huh? They were warriors. They didn't even hunt specifically. What are they sold? 
Uh, the Apaches were born warriors. What time they were five years old, they, they would measure a cup of water in a five-year-old child's mouth, put it in there, and that child was supposed to run five miles. And when he got through running five miles over hill and dale and everything, he was supposed to spit that cup of water back out. He was supposed to hold it in his mouth. That's self-discipline. By the time he was 12 years old, he was supposed to be being able to run 50 miles under terrible conditions. He's supposed to have been run 15 miles of that cup of water in his mouth to spit it out. A Apache warrior did not use horses to fight. You see them in the movies, were for rare and riding horses. They were portable food to the Apaches. The Apaches rode horses to get someplace, and when they rode the horse to death, then they'd eat him. Apaches were born to fight. They were warriors. That's what they did for a living. But they didn't spare the horses. They would ride a horse to death and then eat him. Not spare him. That's what this term means, extreme. Going to extremes. Pushing your body to extremes. It says, uh, not sparing the body. But it says, not in honor. Why, people, uh, there's Muslims that beat themselves. They flagellate themselves. There, there are people that, that, like I said, in the Philippines that beat themselves. There are people that, uh, uh, it, it, that lay, on the, lay on a bed of nails. They walk on coals of fire. Let me tell you a little something, too. You know where it talked about, uh, when it talked about Ahab and all those people making their children pass through the fire? when they made them pass through the fire, there weren't so much talking about burning their little children up. But they trained them in witchcraft. And the occult. And passing through the fire was like these fire walkers do today. You see them. Uh, there's a lot of them from India and everything. This I tell you what, they can walk over this stuff and they've got a mindset. They set their mind and they can walk through there and they do in different places in the world and they walk through the fire. That's what you call passing through the fire. It's going stages of all court worship, becoming very familiar with demons. That's going to extremes, pushing your body to extremes, walking through fire. You heard of those things? They talk about that. How about snake handling? Things like that. I'm not talking about handling snakes and for pets, but people that have in religious worship church taking these snakes up and handling these snakes and, and telling them if a snake bites you, that it's not going to kill you. And they take out Mark, the 16th chapter, which isn't even really in the Bible, and they take this because Paul was bit by a snake one time in the book of Acts. And they, uh, they try to repeat that. Well, that's extremes. Pushing your body to extremes. Extremes. Body not in honor. Not in any honor. But for the satisfaction of the flesh. Look at this word, satisfaction there. Toward, toward the pros, plays, soul, menane. That's an accusing. It means catering to the flesh. Pride is one of those things. Pride. Now Paul is going to start getting first. You know we've gone along for a long time. We haven't talked about drinking, pouring around, gambling, or anything. But Paul starts to start in again. <laughs> and I mean he's going to pour it on us real soon. We've gone through almost uh, two chapters and haven't talked anything about it. But we're just about to get personal again. <laughs> and he's just about to step his foot on our necks. And good for him. We need it now and then. Yes? A grammatical question. In the beginning part of verse 23, that word uh, logon, yes. uh, why isn't that in the nominative case since it's, it's related to estem? It should be a predicate nominative. It's, it's an account like it's going on account, not the account, the, the account is not the subject, but the, the account is the object. 
But does that thing take an object? It, it is. That's an accusing case. Accusing singular masking. That's what it is. That would be exceptional. Which is, yeah, it's the, I told you to begin with, the grammar here is not exactly right. The grammar, the witches, should be plural. And the the local should be should be accused of plural, not not in ma in singular. And then we have a singular verb which is describing the witches over there, the nominative plural neuter. So it doesn't make sense but Paul is drawing out from grammar. The grammar doesn't make sense, but his theology does. So what do you want? Grammar or good taste? He's teaching theology. That's what he's doing. He's teaching theology. He's taking the grammar. He invented a word down here. I mean, he pulled this one out of his hat to invent it, to, to describe something. And he described, he invented other words before this, but this is the only place this one's found in Greek uh, literature any place. You mean like the Othello Bridge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a word that he invented. Now let's go on down here a little bit further. The satisfaction. That word satisfaction there means to fill up to overflowing. It means to be saturated. All of these things, these beatings of the flesh, these starvings of the flesh, these pushing the body more than it can go, it's not for the glory of God, but it's for the sacrifice of the flesh. It is for pride, and he's going to get to pride real soon, too. That's not a good thing, either. Pride is not a good thing. What was one of the ways that, the, that Satan tempted the woman in the garden? What was one of those problems? What was one of the temptations? Pride. Pride. All right. Now we're in the third chapter. In the third chapter of the book of uh, Colossians, it's a beautiful, this is a beautiful book. All that, you know, it, it, we've stretched it out. <laughs> uh, when I taught the book of Jude, we taught 12 classes on the little book of Jude. Well, we've talked, I think this is the 21st or 22nd class that I, I can't remember now. Well, we're only up, we've only come up to the third chapter in the book of Colossians. A. Un. Sin erge fete. Sin erge fete. To, Christo, Pa, Ano, Zetete, Pu, Ho, Christos, Esten, Nen, Nexia, Tu, Theu, Kathemenos. All right, now let's go back here. That's the first class conditional. What do we know about this first class conditional? What is a conditional? What is an English conditional? What is the word? Yeah. If, thank you, brother. If. That's a conditional. In English, if means if. But in Greek, there are four classes of conditionals. And this is a first class conditional. And this conditional is determined as fulfilled. Or as a fact. All right? So how would you translate that? As you do. Since. Since. It's a fact. This is a fact, therefore. All right? This is a fact, or since, or this is a fact. That would be a real good place to do, or a real good translation. It's explained. Therefore, this little particle, ye were raised together. Now here we have, Paul keeps referring to the picture of baptism because he went back to it. You died with Christ. Your old body died with Christ. You left your old body in the grave, the old Adamic, hell-bent person you left in the grave. Now the other half of that baptism is what? There's a dying. What else is in baptism? A new birth? Well, uh, it's a rebirth, all right, but what is it? That it's more than that. It comes from this word right here. Raised up. All right, that's it. You're raised up. You're resurrected. All right? When you make a pro a, a public profession of faith, your old self dies and you leave it in that water. And when you come up out of that water, you are now, by public profession, you are a new person. You are now a new person. 
You were raised up together. Seen, that word's together. Seen egairo. That's what it comes from. And in the chapter 2 and verse 20, he talks about the picture of baptism. Now he's referring back to it again. And it says, uh, you were raised together with the Christo. To Christo. That's instrumental, singular, masculine, and is an, an associated, it's associative instrumental case, by the way. Because it has a word seen there. Associative instrumental case. We need to associate our minds with Christ. And our bodies need to follow along, too. Since therefore ye were raised together with uh, Christ. Christo, what does that mean? It comes from Creole in Greek. Christo. Anointed. Uh -huh. Anointed. Thank you, Brother Mike. You got it. You get an A plus for that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, all right, uh, Christ. All right. Raised together with the Christ. And then it says, Ta ana zeitete. The things, ana, that's kind of like an adverb of place in it. The above things, the upper things, the heavenly things, ye see. And Matthew, the sixth chapter and verse 20. <laughs> Does somebody have a hey, kind of idea they can? Anybody got one with you? A New Testament. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> All right. Sometimes my brain doesn't get the right here. New Testament. New Testament. Uh, Matthew 6 and verse 20. I want you to go and read Matthew 6 and verse 20. The first one to find it, you've got it. I'm going to see who can do the best. When you're doing that, yeah. can I ask a question? Yes, sir. If to Christo is instrumental, <laughs> would it be translated by Christ? Well, it means with because it's seen. With instrumental, associative instrumental scene. Scene erge, erge theta. Raised together with the Christ. With instrumental. Alright? Associative instrumental. Even on top of that. Alright? We were raised together with the Christ. Alright? Have you got that, Brother Dave? Yeah. Alright? What, what translation do you have? Matthew 6 and 20. It's, uh, Something, the first one. A new international version. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, uh, what's it say there? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. All right. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where it, it, that, that those treasures are not going to rust. They're not going to mold. They're not going to de uh, deteriorate. But they're going to wait for you in heaven. That's your ba heavenly bank account. God is just telling you, uh, you know, the old, in 1900, now this may just jar your, it should astonish you. In 1900, the, Amer the, the average American family saved 25% of all their savings. In 1900, they saved 25% of their savings, some up to 50% of their savings. Their earnings? Earnings. Earnings. I mean. Today, very few people even save 2%. The average American family doesn't save 2%. That's real quite large. That's because some of them are saving a lot, the other ones are saving none, or minus. From 25% to 2%, that's a whole lot of difference. But savings, now that's all just physical things, isn't it? How many people are... Remember when I told you to go out and do something eternal this week? Remember I said, go out and do something eternal this week. Go out and do something for the Lord this week. That's what the Lord is telling you through Paul's writings here. Seek the things above. Ta, the things above, the upward things, the heavenly things. Ye see, second person plural, present, imperative, active. You seek it. You seek these things. The Lord told a parable. He said there was a very wealthy man, had a lot of beautiful farm, had a lot of money, 
And he said, I'll tear down all my barns and I'll build better barns. And I will lay up treasures and I will build such big silos and big barns that I am going to be able to retire and I will just take my pleasure and ease for many years to come. What happened to him? This is a very well known story. What happened to him, brother? He got him. He let him do it all, didn't he? He let him tear all those barns out. He let him do all that work, and he let him tear. This absolutely put his iris were full, so to speak. And when he just got the job finished, what happened to him? Thou fool! This day is thy soul required to you. You're dead today. He let him go ahead and go through it, and then all of a sudden he said, you're dead. Did he lay up tre treasures in heaven? What was he in heaven? He was a patokoi. He was among the patokoi. What's a patokoi? In Greek. Patokoi. Awesome. <laughs> That's an absolute destitute beggar. He can't even... He can't even beg on his own. He had to be carried to the beggar line. He was totally destitute, totally, totally dependent upon others for his very living. He became a beggar. He said, seek the things above where whole Christos, where the Christ, he is. Now, we don't believe in three gods, people. I don't care what the Muslims say about us or, or anybody else may say. I don't care how many Catholics bow down to Mary and then Jesus and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all that kind of business. There aren't three gods. There's only one. Now right up here, what it's talking about here, the Christ, he is in the right side of the God setting for himself. Now you're not going to see God the Father over here and God the Son over here. Because the God the Son is what you're going to see in God. That's, that's God. God the Father is God, but He's not a different God than God the Son. He is still one God. Hear, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is three gods. What's it say? One. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And there He is, sitting above not only singular mass and present participle middle voice. Not two gods, not three gods, but one God in glory. Three in verse two. Ta. Ta no. Yes. So what does it mean uh, sitting on the right hand of God? The right side means authority. When Jesus was on this earth, in his body, in his human body. He was subject to the will of God, which God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which are three gods, had laid out in eternity past that in his human form that he would do this. God died on the cross of Calvary. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit tasted death because they are one God on the cross of Calvary. So many people try to make three gods. There is only one God. Setting at the right side of glory means the Son, Jesus Christ, the one that came down to this earth, is in the driver's seat. That's what it means. He is in power. He is in authority. He is. He is. But, but the, the apostles saw him ascend. They saw him go up. And the clouds then obscured him. So... He had a body that had a location. Yes. Now here he's saying that he's, he's at the right hand of God. That means the power. The right word right hand. So you know, he's not literally at the right hand? Not, not literally. literally at the right side. That, that is a term, that is a figure of speech, which means that he is in that place of authority. Brother Mike. All right, he's understood it to be three persons and one God. But when Jesus was praying to himself, uh, to, to, if he was the Father here on the earth, who was he praying to when he was on the earth? That was the human person. That was the human person. 
That was humanity suffering. That was humanity suffering. He was praying to himself. He had to be somebody in control when he was dead. (laughs) Well, what did he do? He said to the Father, he said, I deposit my spirit. What spirit? The spirit that enacted that body. The Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit. His spirit that enacted that body. Part of God, but they're all three make up one God. So I think there had to be a Father in heaven when Jesus uh, went out. And he always, and he, you know, he said that uh, the, I, everything I do, the Father gives me the power. I do nothing on my well, own. What did he tell? What did he tell Doubt and Thomas? Through the and the others, they asked him so many times, "Show us the Father." And what did he say? How long have I been with you? You don't know. That's Philip. Yeah, you know Philip. Now Philip, and then uh, Thomas. He said, "My Lord, my God, my Jehovah, my Elohim," is what he said. The word Elohim. What does it mean? It's plural. It's plural. It's El Hayim. Okay, Im is plural. All right, and it's plural. There is singular, there is dual, and there is plural. And in Greek, there is singular, dual, and plural. By the way, in all Greek, we don't see it very much, but it's there. Okay. Well, plural. That is the powerful one. The the Elohim. What Christ did on earth, the Godhead did. It could be translated God of gods. Yeah. Yeah. Well, isn't that what Paul wrote here? Other other words, when he created it, deity, theos. Remember when he said God, God? That Jesus is God, God. All right? So many times. I had one of my teachers who was a great teacher, but he believed in three gods. And he talked about the Father for a while, he talked about the Son for a God for a while, and talked about the Holy Spirit for a while. And uh, one of my other teachers, he'd get aggravated with him every now and he'd call him the old heretic. He said, we don't believe, we are not uh, polytheist. We are theist. We believe in one God. Not but it says in the beginning that man was created in our image. Yeah, that's not right. Mine. Because it, it was, that was the Godhead. That was the triune God. What we, so many times, we triune means three in one. All right, try you. All right, try you and God, brother Jerry. Well, let us make man. Is in Hebrew, it's a majestic plural. Yes, it's, you get a lot of that in Arabic. Yes, and Arabic is strictly monotheistic. And what it means, majestic plural, it means it's high, mm-hmm. holy, powerful, the high, high God. You all want to make love. It's like your king speaking, saying, "We will do this and that," yeah. <coughs> meaning I'm going to do this and that. Yeah. In the Quran, talk God talks in the plural, doesn't he? That's the majestic plural. That's the majestic plural. They only believe in one God. They only believe in Allah. But when God speaks there, because of the language, because it's so closely related to Hebrew, here we have the triune God. But the triune God is speaking. They just forgot that he's triune. All right? But there's not three of them. All right? Uh, John, this is real deep theology for where, yeah. where we are tonight. And it's beyond us. For me to explain the Trinity is, I'm a very weak vessel. It can't, it can't be explained, I think. No, really, the Trinity can't be explained. We have a triune God manifested to us only in one person that we'll ever see. Uh, John? It's like, I'm, I'm not two people, but when I die... You're separate in your spirit. Yeah. We are made in God's image. We are mind, we are body, and we are spirit. Aren't we? But how many of us are there? How many of us are there? How many of you are there, mind? <laughs> well, we're made in God's image. How many of you are there? Sometimes we feel like two people, don't we? Especially after you're saved, and the body wants to go one direction, and the spirit wants to go another, huh? That explains it. The only way I know how to explain the Trinity is that way, because that's the way God uses to explain the Trinity. And that's the best way that I can think of. People use the eggs, they use apples, they use everything you can think of to explain the Trinity. But God said, I'll make man in my image. And that is the explanation of the Trinity. And everybody ought to be able to figure that one out. And then we have our, our spirit uh, going against our flesh all yes. the time. We have our old nature and our new nature. All right, the old carnal nature, and we're going to get right into that. Paul gets real personal here. He's going to get with it pretty soon. All right. 
And then it says the things above, ta ano fronete me ta epitesges. The things above ye concentrate on. The word spring there is froneo. It means to think with your mind. Study in your mind. It goes back to 218. I want you to understand. I want you now. This is second person plural. Ye do it. Second person plural present imperative active. You do it. That's a command. It's imperative mode. You do it. You keep your mind on the things above. Now, if you didn't keep your mind on the things above, your body could take over, could it? You ever talk to yourself? Have you ever talked to yourself? I haven't ever talked to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to admit it. Every time you answer, you do well, I'll tell you what, you'll get answers sometimes, don't you? Because <coughs> either you do what your spirit wants to, or you do what the flesh wants to. Don't you? How many of you are there? One. But you swear up and down, there's two of you sometimes, huh? Hmm? You ever be doing something and you say, No, nah, I know that the Lord doesn't want me to do well, this. Well, which one is <laughs> mortal mind? Huh? There's mortal mind. Yeah. That could be one part that we don't, we don't want. Yeah. Mortal carn, carnal minded. Carnal minded and then spiritual minded. The two natures, the dual nature. By the way, I'm going to teach you on Sunday morning. I teach the two natures of the saved. All right? Unsaved people have one nature, people. It's all going to hell. <laughs> Unsaved people have one nature. Saved people have two natures. You either know you're doing right or you know you're doing wrong. And if you keep on doing wrong, the best... Well... Baptist theologians in the, for thousands of years, or on the second thousand, hundreds of years, they've always said that saved people ought to act like saved people. If you don't act like a saved person and you continue to go on for 10, 15, 20 years acting like that, you can just about bet your bottom dollar you're not saved. You don't know the Lord. Well, saved people's minds change because you know where you were when you were lost and going to hell. And when God saves you, you also repent at the same time. It means you are sorry for those things. Either you're sorry for them or you're not sorry for them. If you're not sorry for them still, there's something wrong. Something's missing someplace. Keep your feet on the earth, but your head in the clouds. All right, 3 and verse 3. We're moving right along tonight, aren't we? This is almost a record. This is our fourth verse. Apethanete. Apethanete. Gar. Gar. Kai. Kai. Zoe. Zoe. Kimon. Kimon. Kekrite. Zine. To. Christo. Christo. Into Theo. Into Theo. All right. By the way, again, in 3 and 2, you should have gone back to Matthew 6 and 20, where it says, lay treasures up for yourselves in heaven, Philippians 3, 19 and 20, Matthew 16 and verse 23. And uh, here we can cross-reference this to Romans 6 and 2, Philippians 4, 8 and 9, Romans 6 and 2, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, Colossians 2 and 20. Here we have a tremendous verse. These are all commands, and these are all flat statements. Ye die. Apo thonete. It comes from apo and thonesco. Doesn't it? Ye have died. Your old man, when you were baptized, it pictured what happened to you spiritually. All right? You lay down in baptism. Your old body, your old man, you made a public profession of faith. You publicly said what had happened to you in spirit. And you lied. You died. You died. Your old self died. And you ought to leave him there. And the person that comes up out of, that, out of the waters and baptistry ought to be somebody different. It has to be somebody different. It has to be. 
Yes, sir. I thought you changed when you accepted Jesus Christ, uh, not when you're baptized. No. Baptism shows what you did. All right. You, you, when you're you you born again, again before you have You're born again. And then, you're, then you make a public profession of faith in baptism. And that baptism, Paul's using it. I'm not using it. Paul's using it as a baptism. You died to your old flesh. You died to the carn. You died to the sarcos. And you're raised anew to spirit. Anna. Ta'ana. Things above. All right? It has to be that way. Why would God leave you in this world to wallow? You can take a pig and you can shine him up real good. But you let him go out there in a mud hole, some, get around a mud hole someplace, what's he going to do, Brother John? He's going to go run right and jump in that mud hole and just waller around in there like it was chocolate candy. <laughs> Lick her up. He loves it. You take a dog and, and out there in the woods someplace and they'll find something dead to roll in. You know why he does that? Because he's a dog. A hog does it because he's a hog. Hogs and dogs are supposed to do that. Not lambs. Not God's sheep. We're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to be doing something different. They just walk off cliffs. Yeah. <laughs> ye died, for ye died. And the life, the hey, zoe, the life of ye. Now here he says the life. Now he's talking about the life, one singular life, nominally singular feminine, by the way. And now it doesn't agree, does it? The life, it should be the lives, but he's talking about specifying something, isn't he? The life of ye, the life singular of you all, it singularly has been locked up and covered up. And That comes from crypto, and it's perfect, indicative, passive, third person singular. It has been. Here we have a mixture of grammar, too, Brother Jerry, as you see. The things don't agree, but I'll tell you what theologically they agree. The, the Apostle John in the book of Revelation makes the most grammatical mess that you've ever seen in your life. But it means perfect theological sense. Which one? John in the book of Revelation. His, his grammar in the book of Revelation, if you didn't know Hebrew, you'd think he was the poorest Greek grammarian there ever was. But he's writing eternal things from the Hebrew and bringing it right straight into Greek without translating the grammar. So what should uh, character tire be? It has been. It's third person singular, perfect. It should be Ye die, so it says, the lives, it should be, all right, ye die for, and for ye died, and the lives, plural, if it grammatically was supposed to be, all right, mm. all the lives of ye, mm. it says, the life, what life? The life that was imparted to you from the one God, the life, the only life, all right, of ye, it has been the, the life. It has been singularly hidden with a Christ. Seen, told, that's seen, that's the preposition, all right. Seen, told, Christo, with Christ. Instrumental, singular, masculine, and again, it's in an associated instrumental. With a Christ, then it says, in the God, all right. In Christ, with Christ, in the God. Our old nature is dead to God. We are clothed in Christ's righteousness. And we ought to look like it if we are. Just like so yeah. why, why is the material that makes Superman weak called kryptonite? Well, that's just... Story. It's, it's the same word. It, it means hidden. It, that's where it comes from. It comes from this word right here. <coughs> it also means coded. Yeah. So <coughs> Cryptic. Hidden. Yeah. Yeah. Code is a hidden code, a secret. How Cryptic. do you say it again? Kryptonite. Oh, crypt oh, this word here? Yeah. K, crypt, K. It comes from crypto. All right? Kryptonite. That's what they moral terms like that. Now and then from Greek. All right. Well, we've run out of. Well, we, well, we run out of time.
we started just about on time. We're just about running out of time. Yes, Mary. Um, Yes. Underneath that you have a DA, what is that? Definite article. Oh, definite article. Mm -hmm. That's a definite mm -hmm. article. All right. Now on 3 and verse 4, and that's where we'll finish, but we're going to read it. We're going to look at it a little bit because there's so much in this verse that we could spend a whole verse on, or a whole uh, evening on it. You know, actually, until I started picking up my daughter, Dakota, uh, on Wednesday night, I used to teach this class for an hour and a half. I used to wear the people come out. <laughs> for a whole hour and a half from 6 to 7.30. Mike, you were here then, weren't you? And um, Eric, you were here an hour and a half. Oh, I tell you what, I preached for an hour and a half. I'd go home with sore throat. <laughs> but you know what? The Word of God from the inspired Word is full of life. It is exciting to me. We're unveiling mysterious mysteries. We're uncovering secrets as we can. Hotan. Hotan. Ho. Christos. Fonerote. Hey. Zoe. Himon. Coach. Kai. Himes. Zin. Alto. Fonerote. Great. In. Dosa. Dosa. Whatever the Christ, <coughs> he may be manifested. The life of ye, then also ye with him. Ye shall be manifested in glory. This is a very beautiful verse. John 11.25, Galatians 2.20, 1 Corinthians 1.7, 1 Philippians 3.21, 1 Peter 1.13, 1 John 2.28 through 3.2. All referring to this verse here. It talks about living for Christ and letting Christ live in you. <laughs> God didn't save you and leave you in this world to do your thing. God saved you and left, in your, and left you in this world to do His thing. And God wasn't asking too much either. You will never be happy doing your thing. You know that? You're not going to be. There is no fulfillment in things. If Donald Trump would be absolutely honest with you, he would tell you that very thing. And by the way, Paul is going to thrash Donald and a whole lot of other people like him in the next few verses. Self-serving, egotistical, pride, greed, you know what's so bad about gambling? It's idolatry. Paul's going to say that. Greed. You know what's so bad about going out and working so many hard hours to get money and, and just grabbing money and grabbing money and grabbing money and grabbing things as fast as you can? You know what's so bad about it? It's idolatry. What does God think about idolatry? That's not a good word, is it? It's not a good word. But Paul's going to say all that pretty soon in the next verse. These two verses tie very closely together. But the next verse is going to be a hellfire and brimstone sermon in one verse. <laughs> I mean, hard words for carnal people, for worldlings. Worldlings. You know what a worldling is? People don't use that term very much anymore. Somebody that lives totally for the world and the now. For the now. That's a worldling. When God's people are saved, they should be other worldlings. Other worldlings. Everything you do ought to be some way related to God. After you're saved. Some way related to God. Now, don't try to take you in some bar with you, some bingo parlor or something, because you don't belong there and need it to see. I remember uh, I listened to a, a story by J. Vernon McGee. 
and Jay Vernon McGee, he said he surrendered to preach. Well, he'd been going to bars and as a saved person, you know, as a Christian, Francis had been going to bars and going to dances and all kinds of things and, and doing things he shouldn't really be doing, but all of a sudden he surrendered to preach. And so he wasn't going to stop going to these places instantly. He thought he'd just kind of wean himself of it little by little. Well, the place where he was working, first of all, he was going to get, basically, they were going to get rid of him because after he was being able to preach, they didn't like him very much. But he saw one of the people working there, and when he went to this dance one time, he sat around there, and this guy came up to him. He was a world thing, now this guy was. So Jay Vernon McGee, he says, uh, what are you doing here? Preachers don't belong here. You don't belong here. And he said he never went back after that, because he didn't belong there. Even the world has a different kind of an idea how you are supposed to walk as a child of God. Even the world knows what you're supposed to do after you're a child of God. And they're worldly. I remember one preacher one time, old uh, Martin Cannon, was preaching up in uh, some place around Fresno. I can't remember where he lived. Uh, Tulare or Madera or someplace up there. He was preaching and he had a radio program. Quite a preacher he was. And this one guy, uh, he, his wife would go to church, but he wouldn't go to church. He was a lost person. And he uh, had uh, some acreage there, and he would get out there in his old Ford pickup, and he'd drag this log behind the telephone poles and some pipes and stuff to kind of keep the weeds down. And he wouldn't go to church, but his wife saw him out there dragging this log around on her property and didn't need to be drunk because there wasn't any weeds out there, and he just kept on doing this. While he was in there, he was listening to Martin Cannon preach. He wouldn't go to church, but he'd listen to Martin Cannon preach. Well, one day, as he was preaching on the radio live, this guy's out there in the field again, plowing the weeds and dragging down the weeds, and his wife's at church, and he's out there dragging to listen to this radio, and he unhooked hooked that thing and took off to church. He hit the front doors, and Martin Cannon said, I thought he was going to come in and kill somebody. He came in the door so hard. He said he came in the door, and he was, getting, and he was starting to give the invitation. And the Holy Spirit had grabbed the hole in his life. And he ran down this blubber and all the way and hit the altar, begging God to save him, forgive him. And when he got through, he stood up. And when he would go, Martin Cannon would go to his house, he'd tell him how dirty and low down that every church member he had was. How he'd seen them in bars and this and that and everything else. How bad they were. And you know what the, and, and he's, Martin Cameron said, he had the audacity to tell me, now what am I supposed to do? After, since I'm a Christian now, he said, what have you been telling everybody they're supposed to do? Just do what you've been preaching all the time. What you say those Christians have been doing bad, he said, don't do that, you do the right. You know what's right, don't you? And he said, yeah. he already knew what was right. Even the world knows what's right. They're not going to do it, but they know what's right. They know lying, stealing, gambling, cheating, infidelity. They know that that is wrong. Everybody knows that's wrong. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the Word of God tonight. <clears throat> It was sure wonderful as I studied the Word of God. Come back, we're going to get some more of it. It's going to be hot stuff. Just put your uh, asbestos underwear on because you don't need it. <laughs> it's hot stuff from here on. We hadn't got into that much of that. We just got theology. We got, got the person of God. Now Paul's getting personal again. He's going to start thrashing us and whooping us real good because we need it. Brother Dave, would you lead us in prayer, brother? Oh, Holy Father, thank you for all your blessings you've given us. Thank you also for the knowledge and the wisdom and the love we receive today through your Holy Word. Give thanks for our class and our church and the wise people who guide us every day. And I ask that 
you help us in our thoughts, our speech, and the footsteps we take for tomorrow and the days to come. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 are in some way in this verse right here. All the ideas of it. Don't let anyone judge you according to philosophy, uh, tradition. Is this the 30th? Yeah. yeah. Don't let anyone judge you that way. Don't don't let anyone tell you that, that, that you worship these angels that are taken care of. We, we ought to be very thankful for our guardian angels. We ought to be thankful. I'm thankful for them. I mean, I'm here. I'm not in very good shape. I guess I would have had to have been stainless steel coated to get up through all the things I, that I did. You know, I used to be basically six foot tall, six foot two. When I graduated from high school, I was six foot two. But my body is crumpled. <laughs> my neck goes forward. I used to have a long neck. It's not very long anymore. It goes forward. You can put your hand right square behind my neck now because it goes forward because it was broken. That's another thing, another story. I broke it and didn't even go to the doctor. When I after that horse had beat me half to death and everything, I went in there and the doctor said, Jim, did you know you broke your neck sometime or another? When did you break your neck? It was broke. That usually fixes your wagon too, doesn't it? And I'm thankful for angels. I'm thankful for the providence of God. Back then I was just a little old heathen. <laughs> didn't know anything. All the things that have ever happened in my life, God was guiding me to a goal, to serve Him. And everything that ever has happened in your life, God was trying to corral you and guide your life for His service and for His glory and His honor. I don't care how bad you were out in the world, God could use that too. If you were a, 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 a what we call a derelict, or in any way, a jerk, a, 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 a total derelict to this world, totally irresponsible and no good to yourself or your family or anything, you know, God can use that. If you see people in these homeless shelters and everything going there and counseling with these people and saying, I used to be just like you. I used to be a panhandler out here on the street begging and, and all that. I had a stepbrother. He had a pretty good check every month, Social Security, he was dis disabled. And uh, he'd spend that Social Security check on drunks and maidens and whatever else in three or four days, and then he would be out on the street panhandling for the rest and making more money than he got for the price. Very proud of that. Every time he turned around, he was getting a big fall, a windfall of some sort. He had lo lots of money went through his hands. To no avail. All for nothing but to the flesh. Because he didn't have the right state of mind. God can use you. Maybe you were one of those. God can use you to help those people. God can help you if you're a millionaire. He can help you deal with millionaires. If you were once a Muslim, to come into the Christian world, he can help you to reach Muslims. Anything, whatever you are, if you're a Catholic and you were converted, you can reach Catholics for the Lord. There's a lot of Catholics. I tell you what, I've had more success in my ministry reaching Catholics than I have any other group of people. Absolutely. When they hear the Word of God, they're all excited about it. And when they hear the truth preached, they are excited. Thank you for your attention tonight. That, that I'm the long class. I've held you in here for. Got carried away teaching. <laughs> it's Terry's fault. <laughs> God bless you, Terry. I hope we got you all fixed up and everything. And uh, you're a blessing to me so many times. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you all of you for being here tonight. And uh, Brother Dave. Thank you for your humanitarian work you did tonight. 
you're an angel of mercy also. I hope you it's holding right now. It's holding now. Yeah. 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 Don't give me my keys before you're off. <laughs> All right. I don't know. It's a long walk. It's a long walk out there to Metler, I'll tell you. <laughs> Brother Dave, would you just listen to some prayer, please? Okay. Dear Lord, we raise up blessings and praise to you and your godliness and the goodness that you shower down on us each day. We give thanks for the, the, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. And there's no way we can ever repay it. It's, it was just done through grace. We thank you for the knowledge we gain today. And we hope that we can use that knowledge of the Holy Spirit to guide us through the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.